Okay, so Hugh, we need to talk. Thank. <laughs> nice to see yeah. you. <laughs> so you a lot. I've been doing really good. I've been doing really good, keeping an eye on the news. Uh, you know, staying on Reddit, checking out things, watching what you're doing on Reddit as well. Uh, and a lot's been going on. So just kind of to recap, just the last the last week, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, they got their asses handed to them in the election, right? Well, kind of indirect. I mean, the Green Party is a proxy for them, right? So, right, exactly. Yeah. We've also got Greta in the news, right, in Madrid. Yeah, complete cop. Uh, so uh, Torstein sent me a thing saying, uh, I, uh, I told him to patent it, but, you know, he said, a cab. Uh, now means uh, <laughs> all cops are BS. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it just so, makes you uh, laugh to COP25 that all cops are BS. <laughs> and, then the, and then the third thing I want to talk about, this is more on a serious note, is what's going on in Australia. Because it seems to fires? me that yeah. what's, what's happening in Australia, right? The fires, right? Yeah, the fires. Well, and also the heat wave they're going to have next week. So here we are on the weekend, and in the next four to five days, it says in the news that they're going to have a 50 degrees Celsius heat in the southern part of the country. Um, they're even talking about having to evacuate people permanently. And it seems like that's kind of a foreshadowing what's going to happen in the northern hemisphere next summer. Because they're just experiencing summer. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. If they're having not, heat waves, we climate change. You know, it's politics. You know, it's, it depends on who you vote for. <laughs> 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 if you if you vote properly, then basically you're going to expect a little heat because it's kind of economic activity, and basically it means the economy is going well. Nobody should complain. Right. Maybe that's the sleeper subject we talk about as well as what's going on with the economy. Um, I yeah. sent you a link to uh it was like a news article from the fed yeah 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 oh yeah i'd love to talk about that because yeah, um, yeah. i get the impression that nobody in exxon knows quite what to do i i mean this is my read on it and it's always really subjective and hard to to tell but i think that they kind of feel in disarray and people are reporting they're dis in disarray and they don't know what to do about it they kind of right uh, they they almost don't know why they're in disarray. Um, but um, yeah, if I was an XRP feeling very down at the moment, yeah. uh, because they they really um, uh, the inf the expectations were inflated in April, and they really thought you know the the sun shone, shone out of their ass after that, and now they've been brought down with a bump, and yeah. I don't think they really. <laughs> Uh, they, they're not even set up to really analyze why. They're not equipped to do self-analysis. So, uh, yeah, it's really challenging for them. I, I, I'm half expecting this might be the end of them, uh, you know, if not literally, then functionally, because they'll mm -hmm. just go into easy mode. You know, you just, you just be a, kind of a C&D, you know, basically just lobbying from the side, just doing... You know, kind of a waste of time, political lobbying. Um, and you just be a theatrical group on the side. It's very, you know, it's basically the end of the, re the rebellion as much as it started. Yeah. So now, are you, are, you talking, yeah. are you talking specifically about, about XR in the UK or, or internationally? Because some of these other countries have some really powerful, strong XR groups that kind of have distanced themselves from XR UK, like XR Germany. They, you know, they kind of just distance themselves even from one of the co-founders, Roger Hallam. Yeah, but uh, the, the brand is indelibly from Britain. Mm. Um, it, if it, you know, basically, if it flies somewhere else, I can't see another country taking the lead. But everybody, everybody has a lot of discontent. My son I, I was in Hong Kong, and mm. I wrote a little thing on XR Med about, uh, about that. Um, I really wanted him to go to get a taste of what's going on. And now he's just left for, for Thailand. He's in Thailand now, he's just coming back. And um, he said something which today, which uh, really shocked me. And he uh, said that uh, the guys in Thailand, they're all saying, you know, we want what happened in Hong Kong to happen here, like tomorrow. That oh, he wow. said, hey, everybody. And I said, like in Thailand, I thought that's all stable, you know, and said, no, they hate the military government. It's, you know, it's coming down strong. So I think there are all these pockets around the world. 
And whether they'll pick up the XR brand or not is really debatable. I think not because they want something that's really um, effective, you know, so. It gets results, right? (laughs) So, so, you know, if, if you, if you want an insurrection tomorrow, then the guys leading the pack are Hong Kong. They've just had a huge success in the, the amazing election. result. Look at the election. So they had their their event, and then look at the election right after that. Now look at XR in October, and then look at the election. I mean, yeah. XR really thought that they had gained some traction this year, and they were yeah. going to get some traction here in the election, and they got their asses handed to them. Yeah, but you see, the big difference between the two is that the guys in Hong Kong have the courage of their convictions. And uh, they, they are, have no doubt they're standing up against, you know, the, he- the, the hegemon, which is, is China. And they completely all out. They say like Lam Chao, which means, you know, basically take it to the limit. But Lam Chao means to the death. So, I oh, mean, how out of the shoot, people- that's what they were doing? Lam Chao, yeah, that, that's the whole subtext. That you see, we we always love our own interpretation, our liberal interpretation. We we never really dive in to understand where these guys are coming from. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like Lam Chao was the essence of the whole thing in Hong Kong. Yeah, and it's yeah. like nobody even heard of that. And so, 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 you know, so we interpret it as, oh, it's a pro-democracy movement and say, no, they want to burn the system down to the ground. Lam Chao meant this system goes down completely and we prepared to die for it. How many people in XR have the courage of that conviction? That's a good question. I mean, yeah. but for you to say that the, that everyone that's joined XR in the UK, they're gluing themselves to the street, they're bringing out the pink boats, they're disrupting the, uh, the metro, that's conviction, isn't it? To some degree. I mean, no. Mr. Broccoli goes on television. I mean, he's... No, it's, it's very light because we're, what they're fighting for is their privilege. See, everybody like uh, Greta... Yeah, because what Greta goes on uh, behind the mic and then she's, you know, like, uh, you know, you've stolen my future. How dare you? And all of these people are, you know, we want the future that us baby boomers have. And you say, like, you haven't got it yet. That future has gone. There is no way in hell, as somebody in XR in a Western liberal democracy, that you're going to live like a baby boomer. It's absolutely out of the question. Okay, but what about what about the Green New Deal? What about everybody driving hybrids or electric vehicles and the solar panels? It's, it's a complete con because now, all it is is a stimulus package for the economy. The economy is moribund, and the banks are all broke, and so the, there's. We be, we're on the edge of a fiscal crisis, a global fiscal crisis, mm-hmm. and they can't stimulate growth. That's, that's the problem. The whole system needs growth. And so if you start lobbying the government saying, yeah, we must have a Green New Deal, we're worried about climate change, they're going to say yes, sir, and salute because you've just handed them the mandate to do a massive spending project. What they're really doing is they're competing with uh, Belt and Road. So everybody has their own economic stimulus package. And you know, for Putin, it's uh, the Arctic Initiative. Yep. For Xi Jinping, it's uh, Belt and Road. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for us, we either going to do, you know, kind of MAGA uh, kind of thing, or otherwise, uh, Green New Deal. But <clears throat> all of them are exactly the same thing, is they're all trying to stimulate demand uh, in, a, in a place where it's completely credit driven. And everybody's saturated in credit. So, yeah, we can't go anywhere in this economy. And they're going to try and stimulate it. And the, the guys who are doing best of all is Xi, Xi Jinping. So, so here's the thing that XR is, you know, completely ignoring and all that. Oh, you know, we want our future. Is that uh, China's already eaten our future. They, they have already, just if you look at uh, lag in, turbo, in terms of carbon, but they've come out and said, we are not going to even curb our greenhouse gas emissions until 2030, maybe. Right, right, right. And that's a definite. So what they've said is, we, we have no carbon budget. There's no such thing as a carbon budget. It's bullshit that the IPCC, etc. We, 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 we've used that for any, anything like a carbon budget. Every... Every CO2 part per million above 350 was basically past our carbon budget. 
and we're at 415. So, so the, we were so negative on the carbon budget. The right, IPCC already. says themselves on RPC-8, we're heading for four degrees by 2100. It's like, that is saying we're extinct on business as usual. And everybody knows we're not making business as usual. And China is saying, not only that, but we intend to double, double our footprint, right? The biggest greenhouse gas emitter in the world intends to double their footprint by 2030. And they open about it. And nobody else talk about it. I mean, I even see, yeah. you know, Black Bear News and these guys and they're saying, oh, I thought China was really green. It's like, China's no, no, not no, green. No. <clears throat> it's, it's just a complete PR job. They know that right, they right. can't grow without fossil fuels, so they're not even going to try. And that's the message everywhere, and governments everywhere, is that growth comes first. Uh, we'll worry about the environment later. And that's yeah. it. Yeah, well, you know, and I'm seeing that even in your discussions on Reddit. <coughs> so you, you're on, on Reddit, on the subreddit XRMed, and you're posting some of this information, some of these articles, and... Um, it's surprising that people from Extinction Rebellion and, and even from our collapse, even from the Doomer sphere, all of them say, heaven forbid we touch the economy. We cannot hurt the economy. That It's our only chance of, su of surviving is we need the economy to, to save us. Yeah, well, you see, that's... Right? Uh, that's yeah, the only way we're going to get the carbon that. down is, is with an economy. Yeah. See what, see, what I believe is, is obvious. And what I believe comes from, from systems theory. And it's just, it, it's as obvious as the nose in your face. If, if you're banging your head against a brick wall and it's going to kill you, then yeah. you've got to stop. It's, it's a drug habit. You, you just got to stop the drug habit. There's no ifs or buts or can we transition to methadone or something. You say, like, we know what we're doing is bad. We don't have any alternatives. We have to stop this, and then then we can think about something else. But so so, what's that thing? Because a lot of people probably think you're talking about just burning fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. Is that the only thing you're talking about, or is there a layer below that that we need to worry about? It's deindustrialization. Deindustrialization. Yeah, you see, because basically the the entire ecology is based on a hyperindustrialization, and so uh, growth, economic you, growth. Yeah, you you well. Even if we just kept, you see, this is the myth behind the Green New Deal and everything is that uh, people fundamentally, the youth now that are uh, really protesting in XR, they, they don't understand the industrial, mm -hmm. civil, uh, industrial civilization. And they, the key thing that they don't understand is it has to grow. Basically, if you, if you look throughout history, basically civilizations are growing or collapsing. They only have two states. This you know, yeah. steady state thing is entirely mythical. You cannot show me a single uh, example through history where you had a stable civilization that was not growing or collapsing. So what and you're saying is it's not sustainable. It's you're saying that civilization is fundamentally not sustainable. And the reason it's not sustainable, it's built on perpetual growth. And the reason why is something which basically nobody will believe because they taught in school to think civilization is good and it has mm -hmm. net benefits. And you're saying, no, it, it's, it not only doesn't have net benefits, it actually has negative E ROI. So the energy return on investment right, is right, actually right. negative. So, so we're running a deficit. Civilization runs a deficit. And the only reason why it works and expands is they're borrowing. They're borrowing from, you know, tomorrow. They're, they're borrowing from the pushing, future, right? Yeah, they're pushing emissions onto future generations to sort out. They're basically, they, uh, they're exploiting and acting as parasites on the workers and the, the current environment. And they're going back in time to raid fossil fuels out of basically the archaeological record. And so that's yeah. the only reason why, if, if you say- They're taking the past and, and, and stealing the future. They, yeah, they, the past. they basically, <laughs> they're digging up the past and burning it. They're borrowing forward from the future and they're shortchanging the people in the present. And that's the only reason why civilization appears to work. But it, it's, it's like saying, you know, you're having the biggest uh, Burning Man festival or something and say, no, this is self-sustaining. <laughs> it's like, come on, the hangover from this party is going to be incredible. And so uh, that's the bit that they, they don't understand. It, it fundamentally doesn't work. So they're thinking, right. oh, we, we transition to something else. But I, I'll, give, I'll give an example. It's like, 
the way to think of it, and I say this in the Gebekli Tepe video, is think of it like uh, a nightclub. It has all the characteristics of a nightclub. So it's kind of like Burning Man, but assume Burning Man gets taken over by a bunch of hoodlums. So you get a strong man and all his army, and basically they take it over. So imagine people have a nice little party in the park. So, you know, hate Ashbury or the summer of love in 68. And yeah, actually yeah. this happened in 68. Exactly this happened. By 69, all the gang, you know, everybody heard that, oh, you know, free love in hate Ashbury. They all came along. And what happened was you get all these guys, uh, the, the Hells Angels and all these guys, all these hoods yeah. take it over. Then they were exploiting people, they're controlling the drug market. They all, you know, they eventually, you know, it's not free love anymore. It's basically you know, it's <laughs> dope. And it's basically, they took over and now it's a fucking nightclub. And they the, the pimps moved in. in. They the were pimps moved in, basically. The freaking entry because they realized, you know, basically all these kids <laughs> coming to have this party. So think of it like that. Imagine you've got a nightclub, you've got bouncers on the door, you've got a big Han show that owes, owns the nightclub. They give you booze to keep the party going. Everybody comes because you can meet someone there and get sex and, ooh, they have drugs. And so basically everybody's come. Now imagine that uh, is ruining the neighborhood. Say, so, okay, now we all know what this is. This uh, nightclub is ruining the freaking neighborhood uh, it's basically everybody is is spends all their time doing you know drugs partying in the in the nightclub. Yeah. It's ruining the environment for fifty kilometers around, and say like, okay, now we transition to what? <laughs> you tell me. One of you kids in XR, tell me what you transition that nightclub to, to to a picnic. What, what happens to the guy that owns the nightclub? What happens to the bouncers on the door? Do you stop charging entry? You know, the whole thing runs on booze and drugs and basically suckers being sucked in. It's a Ponzi yeah. scheme. Is so it like transition to what? Right? Tell me, what, what is it? I mean, what's the analogy to the equivalent analogy to basically a nightclub that's nice and sustainable and keeps the environment nice it's like you cannot get this nightclub and ch change it into a church meeting and if you do i'll show you that a church meeting is just a nightclub in disguise you have the right. same guys they're sending around the, they charge entry with a collection bucket it all started with religion so right. it's it's uh, yeah okay you, you could you worshiping satan let's say if you're a fundamentalist christian in a nightclub and you were worshiping the other satan if you're in a christian evangelist right, right, they're exactly right. the same you can't transition them to something else so so you know basically these guys have to say what are we transitioning to it's a fantasy i mean do you have right. any ideas what would you transition to what does this well, word mean yeah what does transition even mean you know i, I i'm in the uh, of the positive deep adaptation group so i i'm i'm following you know what what rupert uh reed of xr has been saying Right and Jim Bendel. So I'm more of a, a deep adaptation. Uh, you, you've got to look how far you can go with that, though. I mean, XR talks deep adaptation sometimes, and then they talk Green New Deal sometimes, and those those don't seem to be very compatible. Either yeah. we're preparing for collapse, or we're trying to do this Green New Deal thing that is just going to be a, a delayed collapse. Actually, a worse. Oh, that's the other thing is it's collapse. actually a worse collapse. Yeah, look, it's look at the. Collapse. Yeah, if if you look at how it's financed, all the dollars it's financed by petrodollars, and you right. know all those green jobs turn into basically carbon intensive consumption. Right. So it it's it's a net emitter of CO two. You you know basically you can't say oh well we'll recoup it back later. It's like really. All the CO2 to do this new deal. Go look at the Roosevelt's new deal and you see the carbon footprint of that. Basically, a, a complete infrastructure rebuild, high-speed rail, all of this kind of stuff is a, is a massive amount of carbon. It's enough to kill us. And then, uh, basically, it's up there for a thousand years. So Right, so, right, right. So right. That, that, uh -huh. that's not going to happen. So, okay, let's talk deep adaptation, right? So deep adaptation is where we want to go. Yeah. Yeah, the, there's so many elephants in the room, right? I know, I know, that's the thing. Right, they, they're not saying the first thing is like, okay, 
let's explore this collapse. You know, it's like, hey, we need to, um, you know, basically do permaculture and stuff. It's like, Roger Hallam came from Perth permaculture, <laughs> the city, <laughs> to, to, to basically do Extinction Rebellion. Right, he was doing well, adaptation I mean, and came to the city. Oh, the, the weather's changed. <laughs> you can't do permaculture. Basically, he says everything he does now is in the greenhouse. You can't, you can't. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He couldn't grow crops anymore. That's why he started XR. Yeah. And so mo most of the world is running out of water. So this idea that you can take, you know, well, we'll carry on. It'll be really cool. We'll just basically go out to the Hampstead or something, and then we'll just have a little permaculture, and we'll be all nice and friendly while the rest of the world collapse. No. Nah. The rest no. of the world's not going to leave you alone and collapse. You, you know, do you honestly think you're going to hold on to a vegetable patch while people are starving in London? <laughs> It's like the state's right. going to come and take it. They always do. They always do. So, so they're not really exploring, um, you know, what what collapse is. So it's no point in running through to this this fairyland of sustainability. That's you know, so one moment um, solar panels, and the next moment it's electric vehicles, and the, yeah, it's like, guys, get get real. There's this industry of um, based on e eco anxiety, and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, this I got another friend uh, from the states. His his daughter is in Honduras. She's running mm -hmm. one of these eco villages that's you know basically trailblazing all. This. So so she's the director of this big thing, lots of eco villages and stuff. And I got talking yeah. to her and said, you know, she gives me all the the spiel. The normal spiel that you get in kind of deep adaptation and trailblazing and new way of living and stuff. Yeah. Oh, really? And you, you've got the solar panels and you've got the wind turbines. And it's really what I say, like, okay, after collapse, how much of this can you recreate? Can or you even maintain? Yeah. I mean, can you build a solar panel? Nah. Can you build a wind turbine? Not a chance. It's got electronics in it. It needs industrial civilization to create all of these things. Right, so, all those advanced but, electronics. How are you going to repair so advanced they, electronics? Yeah, so, oh, we, but, but uh, what they're doing is, so I drilled down, drilled down, and then eventually she cracked. And she said, look, okay, you got me. <laughs> she, she cut all the bullshit and all the uh, PR and the spiel. And she said, she said, look, it's just this guy in Honduras who had loads of land that's unproductive. And they found that all these Westerners have you know eco anxiety so then they said oh well they'll just put them take them to the jungle and then basically train them on you know sustainable living survival it's a yeah. complete scam and i said well what are you going to do in collapse she said oh come over here to my dad's boat of course <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't even she was basically it's all a scam and, and yeah, she yeah. Said that eventually i got her to say it in public out, out, right because I just cornered her saying, you know, what can you do? I mean, take a battery. Okay, Vexar believes that there's electric future and stuff. Take a battery, right? A lithium battery is non-recyclable. If mm. everybody has electric cars tomorrow, then basically they- and They last you, 10 you've years. You've got 10 years, 10 mm -hmm. years. And then you're, well, you can recycle a lithium battery. It'll cost you 25 times what it was. And that's with the fossil fuel dividend. Right, so everything now, all the solar panels, solar panels are they're made out of plastic, it's fossil fuel product, right? They all the electronics and basically, basically the photovoltaics, they all done with high intense, high uh, intensity energy. You can't get a solar panel to make other solar panels, <laughs> it would take you a year to get the energy from one solar panel to you, make so another you, one. You, you can't, you can't. You can't make solar panels with solar panels. Yeah, it's, you can't it's, make windmills with windmills. You can't, this high-tech green future requires a high-tech industry. Yes, it cannot make itself because basically it yeah. the, the EROI, I mean, the EROI on, on fuel is coming down, but it's still about 10. If you yeah. look at the EROI on, yeah. on these uh, solar things and stuff, it's, it's like 1.5. You add in the fact that they were well far away and they're only intermittent, and then it goes well below one. They can't pay for themselves. So it's a boondog. 
Okay, so, so, so you're an XR member somewhere in the world and you're watching this video and you're listening to you right now talk. Okay. Oh, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're going, oh, he, he might have a point. This guy might have a point. I mean, you post these things on Reddit on XR Med and, and you have a point and people just either ignore them or you get a little lot of some ignorant comments. But what do you want them? How do you want them to react? I mean, what do you uh, want true. them? To, once people understand and get what you're saying, what do you here's, want? What's, here's what's where next? the conversation stops. Because they, yeah, it, they, it, just, it just stops. Yeah, because they, they know what they have to do. And that's kick the habit. So basically, it's I'm talking be, to be, drug be very clear. What do you mean by click to have? So they're addicted to civilization. Science they're addicted to hot showers. Yeah, and science their iPhones, and industry. Right? Yeah, they have to turn their whole world upside down. They were told science is wonderful. Science is wonderful. And it will go on forever. Yeah. Science is wonderful like crack is wonderful. I, I, can, I can take LSD and stuff, and it's wonderful. But if it's freaking you ruining my life, what do you say? Okay, oh, okay, okay. So you're at, okay. So let's. Are you anti-science? Look, I I am a computer science. I love science. I'm an engineer. Yeah, you're, you're a software a engineer. Life. You're I'm a pilot. You're a former CEO. I mean, you you know this stuff. Yeah, all I've, all I've done is science. And yeah, and I'm telling you now that that you've got to let it go. The now, what do you mean by what do you mean by let it go? Now, there's science. Go. Hold on, there's science and there's technology. No. No, the, there's, there's, there's science and then there's applied, applied science. science. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. can't we just have science, but just not apply the bad stuff? Only if you and, have and apply the good stuff. Uh, only if you have wisdom. So if you have, if you have the wisdom to do research, okay, so research is big business now, right? So, so basically mm -hmm. you need, we're at the point where to investigate further, we need things like CERN and stuff. These are mega billion dollar projects mm -hmm. to make any advance that, the, the thing is, science is in CRISPR and stuff like that. They're, they're making advances, but if you look at the papers, they now have 50 people, 100 people on board. This is, you know, on, on one paper, mm -hmm. the authors are rated in, you know, the hundreds, and sometimes even the thousands. So yeah. it's, it's not science anymore. It's basically industry is doing uh, R&D is basically what it's doing. Nobody's doing pure science. We're all science. Every, you can, yeah, nobody will fund science unless it, it can be applied. Ever, ever since Ma Maggie Thatcher, who was a scientist, said, uh, said basically this is the end of, of pure research. It's basically saying like you have to cost justify what you're doing and it must be commercializable. And, and America, but, but the whole world in fact, is run on that thing is you cannot do research that does yeah. not show anything. So everybody ends with a conclusion that says, and this could help, you know, children with Alzheimer's, this could help with medical benefits, right. this could mitigate climate change, but it's all a con is everybody knows that they're just doing that to get their next round of funding and it's publish or perish. So science itself, it's very high flown to say that, oh, it's this wonderful endeavor where we gather knowledge, it's not. Yeah. Okay. All so, what do you want to gather art? It's basically we we gathering art, and that uh, right, that papers. art is R and D. It's just R and D for yeah, commercialization. Yeah. We're not doing any science. Nobody's done science since since um, since Newton, just about. You know. It's, oh, it's okay. Okay. Fair enough. So so again, your next R listener. And you're kind of freaked out right now, and because and you, you believe what you're saying. Yeah, nobody so believes. What? Nobody's freaked out now because they won't believe me. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> so you're writing off most people. Or they don't. They can't get past this fact. Yeah, but because they, you see, their whole life depends on it. Basically, if if they believe what I'm saying, they have what? to make a complete flip. They have to say a that flip to all, what though? Flip to what? To, to the opposite. So then, which is what? Every, well, just take all the people that told you, all, all your, the authority figures that you, you revered authority figures. Now you suddenly realize the authority figures were your worst enemy. Okay, yeah, Miss Golden at, at you know, primary school who showed you what your potential and, and basically, got, and then all the guys that picked you up along the way, all this, you know, the psychiatrist that you basically had all this transference, you know, this Freudian yeah. transference, and you really love them because they put them on, put you on, and now you say, these guys just put me back on a fucking plantation. These guys are all part of the system that just put me back in the meat grinder. That's their job. 
because Miss right. Golden prepared me for the meat grinder. These guys basically patched me up and sent me. It's basically, it's like a war. And there are all these armies of people that are pushing you onto the front line so that you fodder. You basically just fodder into this, this uh, project, which is just a complete meat grinder. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I have to say, well, but, but, but what about healthcare and stuff? And you say, well, you know, healthcare saved, you know, Uncle Tom. And, you know, it saved, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if we didn't have, you know, fMRIs and stuff, then basically Auntie Margaret would be dead now. And then yeah. you, you have to say, she should be dead now. <laughs> Her life is not legitimate. Well, take your pick. We all did. If you, if you want fMRIs, right, you cannot have an fMRI machine in the jungle. So right, if, right, no, right, right, right. If you so, want an fMRI machine, <laughs> you need industrial civilization behind it. Right, If you right, stick right. with industrial civilization, it's going to kill us because it has to grow. It has to use up. It has ecology. to. Yeah. It has and to. What people, you see, you see the, the, the obstacles of denial is to say that, in, in essence, it goes down to, I have to die. I have to be integrated with nature. And nature means... I get eaten by a bear or I get eaten internally from cancer or some disease. And people say that is not acceptable. So, okay, then we all dead. Take your pick. And people now are in a position where they kind of like, screw this, man, we're all dead, but I want hot healthcare. Okay. Right. Right. You did a video last summer um, after XR was really successful in April with their first uh, big initiative um, in action, you, you did a video and you said, okay, what's next? And you wanted them to push for a, a debt strike for climate, or at least have them push for debt forgiveness, right? I've got to be, I've got to be honest about this, this debt strike. I, I, I was actually being devious because what they don't know is, they, you know, Exxon is virtually numerate. They certainly economically illiterate and financially illiterate. What they don't know is that the whole system runs on debt. It's a stealth way of actually just sabotaging the system. So if they did a debt strike, you see the whole thing runs on debt because it's borrowing forward. It's a Ponzi scheme, right? And, and so, right, if, right. So if you do a debt strike, you, you, you inhibit the system's ability to borrow forward. Since mm -hmm. it can't account for itself, it'll implode as soon after that happens. Now, it is dangerous because we are at peak debt. And if you did say a debt jubilee for it's, it's never going to happen, right? A debt jubilee is never really going to happen because basically the banks have a, a lock uh, the central banks have a but lock. There's, but there's tremendous momentum, especially in the United States for some kind of a debt forgiveness. Some of the yes. people running for president yes. are actually talking about this. I and mean, yes. there's a lot of momentum for that. And if there's a glitch in the economy like there was in 2008 and there's any sign of bailouts to the banks, all those students are going to say, wait a second, if, if you're going to help the banks, you, you, you've got to combine that with some debt forgiveness. Okay, this is what they don't understand about right? the financial economy. So Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders has said he will do debt forgiveness for students. Okay. Right. When, if he's not going to get to be um, to be president, but if he did, they they would immediately sit him down and explain to him <laughs> <laughs> that, like Bernie, I forget your campaign promises, but you cannot do that because there is 1.6 trillion in outstanding student debt. It's mainly being absorbed by the government because basically. They've just had to gobble it up. Nobody would accept the debt. They know that all these students are not good for repayment. And basically, if you're a student, just uh, take heed of that, is they don't consider you a good bet because they don't consider you will ever um, make the money back on your investment in your own education. So there you go. There's an endorsement for your education. Is <laughs> the banks, you can't take it to the bank. <laughs> <Right, literally. right. laughs> So the, so the Fed had and the government had to buy up a lot, of, maybe 50%. I'm not really sure my figures there, but a lot of the 1.6. It's effectively yeah. bad debt. Right. You know, it's, so, so why does it stay on the books? You say it's bad debt, just forgive it. All these kids then would be free. They could start their lives and basically it would be a big boost to the economy. 
Yeah, I mean, the bailouts to the banks, that's a, a form of forgiveness of debt, right? By giving them yeah. money to cover their bad, that bad loans. Now, now comes the bit that people don't know about the economy. And that's, that's why a debt strike and stuff would basically kick in the door that would bring the house down. It, because that, that 1.6 trillion is collateralized about right. 30 times. Basically, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, hypothesized, right? Um, so basically, what um, it's resold in a million ways. Because if, right. if I have a debt instrument, if you owe me money, the, the law for a long time has made transfer of debt more secure than actual debt. So if I get a, a, a note from you, basically an IOU from you, yeah. Well, it's it's not so strong in law. You can always tell me, ah, I can't repay, and ah, I might be able to. Re Here's the thing: if I just sign that over to somebody else, nobody wanted to take somebody else's debt, so debt wasn't really transferable. So they changed the law long ago in all countries, virtually, to say that you have, you know, the strength of the law squared if you transfer that debt. So if I'm right. prepared to buy someone else's debt, oh, I have the rights to your kids. <laughs> I, can, I have basically, you know, you know basically well, the full force of the law know that. behind that because they want to make debt liquid. Yeah, yeah. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with that. It incentivized banks and anybody that could get retail debt some, from somebody like a student loan to pass it on like a hot potato. <laughs> so, right. Or, and so Here's the next problem. Once you're passing on that debt, there's a million ways that you can actually make derivative of the instruments from right, it. Right. So then I can say, well, what happens if you defaulted on that debt? Well, I'll sell you insurance on it so that if you defaulted, then I will basically pay you a, cent a percentage of it or whatever. And then basically, so then that's a collateralized debt obligation. So CDOs say, oh, wait a minute. What happens if the interest rate comes up, goes up, and I'm underwater on the debt in your interest rate? Right. Ooh, I'll get I'll get a good convertible debt swap. So it says, well, you know, and all these. So how many times can you do this? An unlimited time. This is an unrestricted market that basically, after liberalization in the 80s, basically it wasn't unrestricted. So here's the thing: it ballooned from the 80s zero to now it's 1.5 quadrillion. Quadrillion, quadrillion dollars. Yep. Yeah, that's, that, that yep. is a thousand trillion, 1.5 thousand trillion. Now compare that to the entire GDP of the globe, that's 70 trillion. Compare it to the US GDP, something like 14 trillion. This is 1.5 quadrillion. Quadrillion dollars. So, so this is like 2008 collapse on steroids, right? Okay, so, yeah. so it sounds like we've got two bombs here. We've got one bomb we're sitting on, which is the derivatives market, the economy itself. And the other one is the clath rate bomb, the methane. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. You know where I'm going with this. Right, bomb, isn't it? You know exactly where I'm going with this, right? Yeah, it's a good thing to think about. And, and, and when you posted, let me finish, you posted on Reddit, you said, hey, we've got a choice here, right? Yeah. Because when this goes off, everybody is dead. Yeah, right? the clath rate bomb is for real. It's not okay, and, and, and we could spend hours talking about that. And, and those people yeah. that don't know about it or don't believe in it, that's fine. But it's if it's out there and it's real, right? It's what's going to get us. It's, it's what's going. It's what's going to get us. It's, it like sterilizes the ocean. It, it's really bad, really. And yeah. then we've got this derivatives it's market. Too, it's methane, the clath rate. Yeah. It's, yeah. Sorry, methane. So yeah, and 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 then we've got over here. We've got this wonderful man-made derivatives market. The whole system, the whole thing is sitting on this. And we saw in two thousand eight. Once it goes, it's almost like that other bomb. Once it goes, no one can really stop it, right? I mean, uh, no. So all, it, all hell breaks loose, right? But it, here's it one thing we know from 2008. 2008. One thing yeah, we know so from it, 2008 it, it, is it blew up in 2008. That right, 1.5 quadrillion, the market went to zero. The basically, yeah, the right. traders stood with their hands at their sides. There was no trade. It just it poof, it gone. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, but we know that the economy dropped by 12 percent, and sure enough, that one year. <laughs> the CO2 emissions drop by 12%. Okay, okay, so, so this is the thing. This is where I, we've been in la-la land since 2008. And that, nobody really understands that. So the derivatives market, it collapsed. And, and everybody was broke. Everyone. It's not right. just Lehman Brothers and all these guys. It's basically 
JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank has uh, six trillion, six trillion on its books of this worthless paper. Ba they're basically side bits. They're ba basically they're all side bits. Horse, yeah, the horses have died on the track, but everybody <laughs> claims <laughs> they're well. <laughs> uh, I think over the air will come in and stuff like over the air died. Well, let's just say you didn't because I need this ticket. Let's just keep let's just enough. keep betting, man. Let's just keep yeah. betting. It, it's betting on horses. You're the horse. Yeah. You as the debt slave are the horse. And so right. the, what they've done is they hypothecated the debt to 30 times. So every every dollar of debt that you got for retail on your car and your house and your student loan, they hypothecated it 30 times. And sold so that, it resold. Yep. Yeah, so uh, of a million different things of, uh, it, it's, they're so exotic, there's no one in the world that understands the derivatives market. It's just a zoo of, you know, crazy right. side bets. And it's, and it's fully automated too, right? All these algorithms are ready to go when certain weird shit happens in the market that no one no, understands. So derivatives are not quite traded uh, like high frequency trading. Those, those are stocks and futures. But the derivatives trade is because they're exotic instruments, um, they're not, there's no standard contract for them. And it's very, very opaque. Nobody so knows the, what's in that pile. Exactly, exactly. So, so the good news is, if that goes down, if the economy actually on its own, nobody does anything, if the economy collapses, we know for a fact from 2008 that for at least CO2 emissions are going to go down as well. Economic activity goes down. No, we know no, CO2 no. Emissions you go down. We have to go back to 2008. Yeah. So to, it, it, the game ended in 2008. The, that 1.5 quadrillion went to zero. It never came back. You say, well, how come we still got an economy? Why did it still carry on? They, they right. did three, three, quantitative easing, three rounds of quantitative easing. And then basically you said, okay, well, but we were fine. We all went, uh, no. What they did in 2008 was they, everybody was broke. So they just made an agreement that we would just cancel um, the standard accounting practices. So the, the generally agreed accounting practices, GAP, they just suspended them. All, all they said was they suspended a, what's called accounting rule 157C. And mm -hmm. 157C said, it was a fairly recent thing, but it said, if you have any of these crap exotic you know, instruments, mm -hmm you have to mark, mark them to market. So accountants had to say, if I have this side bet that says, you know, over the air will come in, I can't just say it's, you know, it's worth a billion dollars. I have to say what it's worth on the open market. The open market was ended in 2008. Right, so value to zero, so. So what they said was, you can account for it in any reasonable manner. And of course, accountants being, conservative all they did was they said well we'll just pretend it's worth what we paid for it and so they all went on with the scan every bank you know has yeah, all yeah. this worthless paper that's not tradable uh, so it did kind of work because basically they did start to trade it again on the fake here's the problem it got bigger so it didn't get any realer it actually just got bigger so that, that pile of, uh, of worthless paper got bigger and it's just a scam. So it's still out there. All that shit that, got that caused the... It's got bigger. It's a bigger dumpster fire than it was in 2008. Yeah. Everybody just makes up their own accounting rules in effect for okay. what, now, what their share of it is worth. So we were in La La Land. Okay. So, but that shouldn't scare anybody that's in XR, right? I mean, if you're an Instinct and Rebellion... You want to see the CO2 reduce. You want to see the, I mean, the goals of them are to tell the truth, get CO2 emissions down, right? Zero emissions. What better way than to have an economic collapse? I keep that sounds horrific, thing. doesn't it? Nobody knows what, what so, so since 2008, that's the collapse. Now we just carried on whistling through the graveyard. We're just in a world of twilight pretense. So it's we're like, we're like, we're it's like Wile E. Coyote. Yeah. We went off the cliff already. We just haven't looked down yet. Well, no one knows because no one's ever been here before. It basically, imagine, imagine everybody is just uh, everything, you know, valuations of a company are all fake. Everything, you know, basically every, every instrument that's traded, even down to a treasury is completely fake. 
nobody really knows what it what it's worth and it's just we're in la la land it's okay, not so? related to production. You see, what they need to do is to get production back so that production, you, the wage slaves have to be productive enough that they're serving the debt. Yeah, but production no means... Ways. You, we would need 10 planets and a thousand years to pay back the debt. To pay back. Out. We're never going to, they're, they're never going to pay that back, right? They could just, they, can they just zero it out and then, and well, then just continue production? This is the way they've, in effect, zeroed it out. Is they've said is basically done what's called MMT or modern monetary theory, and that just says, well, the Fed just keeps on giving money, <laughs> they keep on doing QE. Uh, uh, but, but, so, but things like that are financing the destruction of the plan. That China is financing all of their Belt and Road Initiative. That's all debt, right? Yes. Isn't isn't it's it done, Western? If I'm not mistaken, internal. Western Western banks and Chinese banks are financing all of these coal plants that China's building yes. one per week. Yes. They're putting a new China coal plant online. You've, you've yes. documented this. It's been documented. I mean, that's not made up. That's a fact. And, and they, all and of that's going to come to a halt. Just like we export our carbon footprint to China, China's exporting it to all the Belt and Road countries, which are right. about 100, 126 other countries. And they're building coal-fired power stations. They're like crazy. They're the building dirty one ones. a week in China. But and they're, they're dirty ones. In These Africa are the dirty and ones. stuff like that like crazy. Yeah. And they're the dirty coal plants. Yeah, because they have dirty coal in China. It's, it's highly yeah, sulfurous. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, so we've got that going on, and then we've got this other thing going on over here. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you're, so again, you're an XR. You're a member of XR. You're in the UK, and you're a little disappointed what happened at the election. You don't want to dress up and do cosplay in the streets. You don't want to glue yourself. You don't want to go to the metro. But you want to do something. You, you have to make the system. What do you do? Collapse. You have to make the system collapse. The, 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 the industrial system. So, so the Green New Deal, the Green New Deal, the, the, one, that, the one that's just been approved now in, in the EU, they very scrupulously mm -hmm. don't say where the financing comes from and uh, how it'll be used and the impact. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. do any carbon impact assessment or anything on the finances. The reason is because it's a complete fraud. What, it's, what that Green New Deal is, is they will do it with borrowed money. They're borrowing from us, from the taxpayer. But it's they, all debt. The, yeah, the, it'll be done exactly like Greece. They're doing what they did to Greece. To bail out Deutsche Bank, they, we're the new Greece. Right, the world is the new Greece. The Green New Deal is the new Greece. So basically, they're using the eco uh, the ecological system like Greece, and they pretend they're investing in all this green tech and stuff like that. It just goes straight through to prop up Deutsche Bank. Just exactly what Greece. The money, the 110 billion that Greece uh, borrowed, it didn't mm -hmm. even touch the ground. It went. It didn't even hit Athens before it went back to the ECB, and the, and basically it was used for Credit Lyonnais and for um, for Deutsche Bank uh, to dump all the bad Greek debt. Now that's what they're going to use this Green New Deal. It's a basically so that right. they can they can uh, resettle like particularly Deutsche Bank's books, mm -hmm. so that Deutsche Bank will get this trillion. <clears throat> it will basically uh, hypothecate it, basically lend it on, and all that money will go into uh, deficit spending four green new deals and everybody will is supposed to like it because they're like look what we're doing we're exporting our carbon footprint to china now we have uh, you know windmills we have these turbines and we have the the photovoltaics and we're all going electric cars and we're getting off our you know gas bonuses and we're insulating our homes yay finally the government is doing something no they're not those those uh, everything that was manufactured that goes into Britain, that looks green, it's paid for by debt, goes straight to China. China is right. uh, basically right. letting out all the greenhouse gases. Those uh, basically, the greenhouse gases are gonna go through the roof to pay for your solar panel and your electric car. <laughs> They're not manufactured in Britain because that would make it look awful. So basically from this tricky accounting that Greta knows this, she, she pointed it out. They'll use trick accounting. They basically, they'll export the carbon footprint and then China will manufacture the goods. It'll take that money and then Xi Jinping intends to make uh, the Chinese, which now has half the standard of living of uh, people in the United States, he will to exceed the people you know, that. So he's right. going to make the average Chinese, four, so China's four times bigger than, than America. Basically, he's going to take 
four times as many people, 1.4 uh, billion people, and make, make their consumption exceed that of America. Now, I'm telling you, America already is chewing up 1.5 planets minimum. Yeah, just the, just the United States. Yeah. So he's yeah. going to push it to four planets of consumption emissions, and uh, we're fucked. Basically. We don't have four planets. We only have one. Yeah. And, and so the, 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 the only way you can stop this game is to stop them doing the, the Green New Deals, to stop the Belt and Road. And it's easy. It all stops. It's all done by deficit spending. So it basically, if the, if the debt markets freeze, and the, they're easy to freeze because we have peak debt. Right. If you freeze those, if everybody understood what I'm saying, but it's really hard because I don't know any way you can condense it more. And people don't have more than you know, not 10 seconds to listen to a soundbite. So just yeah. listening to the, what I've just said now is beyond most people's attention span. And you, you would have to get a large number of people to understand what I've just said and then basically say, we need to basically put, slam the brakes on industrial civilization, which no one wants to do. Okay, okay. And we so have to act in 2020. So, so realistically, it's not really going to happen. But that's what you would have to do. Um, to we, we don't in no scenario do we do we come through unscathed? Do we come through with 7.7 .7 billion people? There's going to be a mass die off, and that mass die off is is going to be it's it's very easy to predict because they predicted in 1972 in the limits to growth. They said we would be at um, uh, basically peak production in 2008. Bingo! Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were yeah, so yeah. on the money. They said we would be at peak food in 2020. Hello! <laughs> Hello! And they said we'd be at peak population by 2030 because then there would be a mass die-off. And they even got the population right. Yeah. So if we, if we let this run, let the, the growth in population run, by 2050, uh, we would be at 10, we'd be over 10 billion. There's no way we can feed half those people. No, so no, if you no, can't, no. it doesn't work like, oh, well then half a buggered. Doesn't quite work that way. No, 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 no. It's basically, if you can't feed half the people in the lifeboat, it means that the lifeboat's going to die off to maybe everyone, right? Right, right. Yeah. yeah, you know, you had a great discussion of this on on XR Med on, on Reddit. And there was a lot of people talking about this whole thing about 7.7 .7 billion. Roger Halem said that 6 billion might die if we don't do what XR wants them to do. Uh, and then you blame the economists. Yeah, because what the, what the economists are, see, what's the economists, up with that? You blame the economists? Ah, you see, they're, Our politicians? they're, two, they're two terrible villains uh, that, that have, <laughs> so far have, have flown undercover. And that's the psychologists and, and, um, and the uh, economists. So they, they've both been doing kind of the same thing and they've been patching up the system and basically hiding its faults and spreading. Okay. Basically, they've been shills. So psychologists have, you know, been a lot behind PR and uh, advertising, mm -hmm. increasing right. demand and false consumption, the, you know, increasing consumerism, all the yeah. stuff that basically yeah. uh, made the consumerist, the selfish consumerist econ, yes. uh, was came from psychology. Now, psychology. Psychologists, yep. the psychologists say, oh, you know, uh, the economists uh, have this model of an econ, a selfish consumer. And it's not right because people are not rational, blah, blah, blah. So they, they feel antagonistic towards each other, but they really just completely in the same camp. Partners in crime. Yeah. And so, so the crime of the economists was, uh, goes all the way back to Adam Smith. And that's basically saying it was fundamentally wrong. The first great sin was to say that basically human, um, human well-being has to be measured in terms of a chicken in every pot. In other words, everybody has to be a materialist. And if you want to solve the world, all the world's problems come from want. And so if you solve want, solve you want. everybody has prosperity and material happiness, then we're fine. Everybody's problems are solved if they get what they want. Yeah, but you see, they, what they were hiding was the fact that the want came from the fact that they enclosed the land and locked up the food. Right. So you see, that's the bit that they, they completely smoothed in over. So they had everybody in a labor camp 
working towards this bigger prosperity. And every year it was like so damn cool because now we've got refrigerators, now we've got cars. And so every, you know, basically the, the 1950s model of the, you know, fabulous automated household and the washing machine, the refrigerator and the microwave yeah. oven. Wow, we just headed for the stars. It's Jetsons next. We said, where's the flying car? Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, so, so everybody was on board with this, not seeing that, oh, this is going to end with a bump because it's done with deficit spending on the ecology and basically right, future right. generations. And so now the economists should be shot because they unrepentant now because what they're saying is the worst thing you could say at this time. And that's saying okay. that you can have GDP growth. We can still have growth without using more resources. Yeah, and people of economists, there are a couple of people with MBAs told you that on Reddit. They said, yeah, but, but, we can absolutely but people have like economic that growth. Drag and, into the street. And if you knew the damage for what they were saying, it's far worse than, say, you know, what Goebbels was saying at rallies. So the consequences of what they are saying, although they're stupid and they don't realize, you know, what they're saying, they, uh, you know, I don't think stupidity is an excuse here. They should be dragged out in the street and they should basically pop a cap in the back of their head because you, you would do that to Goebbels, wouldn't you? If, if you knew that what Goebbels was saying or Hitler was saying at the Nuremberg rally, if you say, whoa, that translates to carnage in the, oh, in, in the Soviet Union and stuff. If you, you know, if you could go back, anybody that could you know, come from 2050, if anybody's still around, and come back to today, without hesitation, they would pop a cap in the back of their neck. So, but, of, of economists. Of economists. Because, because what they're saying is so dangerous to say, uh, to say, to say no, we can carry on. Because we, if, we, if we have any hope at all, uh, it's got to be very soon in 2020, even, even the, you know, the liars. Time and, is running out. Time yeah, is IPCC running out. IPCC even says it's 10 years or we toast. And so it's like, mm -hmm. they're costing us 10 years. How long do you think it'll take before people see through a Green New Deal? It's basic, basically, you, they're going to get all the crap accounting and stuff. At some stage, the scientists are going to come back and saying, you know, it's weird, mm -hmm. but greenhouse gas emissions are not going down. CO2 is still going down. Britain is fabulous. Look at there. And then everybody will start pointing fingers. Britain will say, you know, mm -hmm. Sweden, Europe will say, look at our fantastic record on being green. Our emissions are going down. And look at China. China's are going, and they won't say, well, we exported them and all of that kind of thing. So all of this, you know, crooked accounting for carbon, uh, you know, they say, we, you know, just the fact that they put a tax on in Europe, a carbon tax, yeah, means they will export all of this to the Belt and Road Initiative. So basically, they export in consumption of oil and uh, fossil fuels to places like Africa. Great. Yeah, but, we, but we all live on the same planet. If there's one yeah. sphere, we're all in the same planet together. There's one, yeah. it's one thing here. Yeah, so, so, so now <laughs> it doesn't matter where you burn the coal. Forward and they'll say, what are you against Africans? Africans have a right to all prosperity too. So, yeah. That, right. that, that, and they're right. They do. Yeah. Well, we they just, don't. No, no. You see, economists have well, told nobody us does. They do. But I'm right, saying, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Saying, right, right, nobody right. has. We didn't have a right to to drive cars around and stuff like that. People in Africa don't have any more right to prosperity than we did. Well, for example, uh, here's a good example of that. So, it, so the, the Amazon. They're burning the Amazon down, and it's financed by Western banks to grow soy to feed cattle that's grown in the Amazon. And all that meat goes to China because China wants steak. They want hamburger. They want, yeah. they want our standard of living. Yep. So we're, and, and no one speaks for the rainforest. Well, there's a million people that live in the rainforest that can speak, but we don't really listen to them. And it's, and it's, it's you know, people are, bankers are getting their bonuses at the end of the year for yeah. this. So, so, right? here's, so here's the problem. And, is, and, and, but, but don't they have the right to have their hamburgers over in China? Yeah, but you see, now here's the really dangerous part where economists step in. Yeah, economists say they have the right for that, for that hamburger. Economists, economists have this big blind spot, and, and that's technology. So, so science and industry, basically the heart of industrialization is all these guys are you know, fine to talk about you know, the means of production and all of this mm -hmm. kind of thing, but... I've never met an economist that doesn't that actually understands science and engineering. 
So that basically they all think it's magic. And it right. always delivers. It's just this, this magic cow that keeps on giving. So then they say, oh, you'll never have a Malthusian catastrophe because basically you get technological innovation, you get the green revolution, and then technology delivers. And you say, right. always. You, yeah, but you can only say that if you don't understand it. And so then if you analyze what actually happened to stop a Malthusian uh, catastrophe was, one, the Harbor Bosch process. There's only mm -hmm. one of those. And the harbor right. process is destroying the soil. So it's finite. It's basically, we only got 40 it's years. It's not sustainable. Left. It's, yeah. it's absolutely not sustainable. Right. The harbor Bosch process alone consumes about 3% of the uh, Earth's energy. You're not going to supply the harbor Bosch process with a fucking wind turbine, I'm telling you now. So basically, right. we, we are, in essence, and then the other thing was oil, cheap oil. In essence, our grains are food, it's basically oil on a stalk. So everything in the green revolution, they, they can't, they can genetically engineer some aspects of food, but you cannot engineer productivity uh, very much. So nutrition went down. What they don't say about the green uh, revolution was, although quantity went up, basically the nutrition of say the grains went down. So what right. a, the fundamental thing that economists don't understand about technology and the, this magic wand is, is that it just allows you to transfer limits. So if, if I find a limit, something like, you know, with fossil fuels, it runs out. If, um, uh, then I can switch to electric. And they think, oh, we'll always be able to, and what they're saying is we'll always be able to basically get quality of products uh, and basically not increase resources. So then they think, oh, we can recycle stuff. And then, no, you can't. So, so what, you know, you can't recycle things like lithium. So, and so what we're doing with, uh, you know, green tech and stuff is we just transferring the limit to saying, you know, we've reached the emissions limit or something on, on fossil fuels. And then we transfer it to something like, um, you know, uh, iridium or beryllium or one of the rare earth metals uh, that they, you know, basically need um, nickel and all of these things. Uh, basically, the, we don't have the copper to electrify the world. So basically, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no technological innovation that will get you copper or one of these rare earth minerals. But they say, right, oh, right. We'll innovate around it. And say, it's, you just don't understand the engineering, is that we've reached the limits of, of how far we can go. And there's no magic pixie dust. Now, economists don't, don't, um, don't understand that, but they're making everybody throw the dice on this basically magical thinking. It's, it's, it's absolutely pure superstition. It's the, the superstitious belief that technology will always deliver. And they've sold it to the world. And the net result is that we, all the time we have left to stop, uh, you know, basically we're in a race against the tipping point. So we'd have to stop the economy now to avoid tipping points. I mean, it, we've passed the tipping points, it looks like, in the Arctic. The Arctic's a net uh, CO2 emitter, and now the methane's <laughs> spiking. So it's, it's in runaway. Whatever we do now, the natural process is already in runaway. So it looks like we toast. Okay. But at this point, if there was any hope, it would be just slamming on the brakes. Now, we're never going to do that because economists are telling us we don't have to. They're saying basically we can still grow the economy and basically we don't have to um, uh, consume more resources. So they're saying you had and a that's crap. that's the big lie. Yeah. You had a crap phone in 2000 and now you've got a super smartphone. And basically, see, basically you're having growth, GDP growth. You know, an iPhone is, you know, worth a billion times what your phone was worth in, you know, yeah, yeah. 2000 in, compa in comparison. But then if you take that t technological discount into, into account, well, then basically things are improving. And you're saying like, yeah, but have a look at what an iPhone's made out of. We can't right. go on making those things for more than a couple of years more. No, no, they're not, it's not sustainable. And all you the can't, rare earth you metals. can't give everybody, you can't give 7.7 .7 billion people an iPhone and you certainly can't give 10 billion. Okay, so, okay. So I agree with everything you said. Let's, let's just assume that's all true. Okay. Then what? So we need, we need to... You've lost most of your audience. You realize that. Most okay, well, people uh, at this point... Lose, let me lose the rest. Let me you've lose been talking. Rest. How long have you been talking? 
for an hour? Yeah, long enough. But Okay, okay. So let's just assume most people have just tuned out. And yeah. now you've got this sweet spot of these people. They're just listening to everything you're saying. They're going, I know, I know. Oh, shit. I know, I know. And they're at this if point any, now. If anybody's left watching this the, conversation. The people, exactly. Then, then they're probably. The room. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Before you, before you clear the room, they're, prob <laughs> they're probably Cassandras, right? They're probably people like yourself. Who see who see what's going on, or, or depressed people? You see, or depressed, depressed people, people, and they feel yeah. alone. They feel alone, yeah. and they're not sure what the heck's to do. Right? It's eco anxiety, right? Um, uh, eco depression more. This is eco, okay. Eco depression. I, I lost all the eco anxiety people because the eco anxiety people are, are looking for um, uh, uh, what do you call it? not an analgesic, the opposite, Anx anxio anxiolytic they're looking for an anxiolytic an anxiolytic is medicine that stops making you feel anxious so right. and, I, and everything I, you're saying is making people more anxious and they yeah. at some so, point so they, they just tune out, out. They, they're not they're, listening anymore nope. because there's like uh, you know xr uh, they they give me my uh, my anxiolytics basically they they have lots of good stories and make me when i leave xr i feel good Right, right. And so they get it. So, so I've lost them because I'm not making them feel good. Okay, so you've got the Cassandras, you've got the people. Just so, so, sweet. so all that's left is is depressed people that say, you know, okay, yeah, we're at screwed. This stage of the conversation, you you've got some people that say, yeah, this, this it's kind of I know all this that this guy is saying, and then it's basically, and I'm depressed as hell. And well, I'll say one thing first is that. You, if you're depressed and looking at this situation, you're, you're probably making a more accurate assessment than, than anybody. There's a lot of right. research in decision theory that says uh, depressed people make far, far better decisions than people that are optimistic. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so yeah. let's Process stash, information let's, let's stash out. So yeah, what's your if message? You, if you're depressed, you, you're better at processing information by far than the average person. So, okay, okay. You, you, so you've got us there. So. Let's hear so, okay, it. Okay, now let me clear the room. <laughs> <Clear> the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be us at the end of this. It's just going to be the two of us and no one watching. <laughs> yeah, that's where we're going to get to. So uh, here's the bad news. And if you stand, stand on the brakes um, of uh, this civilization, is, is it's, uh, it is supporting, I don't know how many people, but a lot. But not everybody. Not, Not everybody. everybody. There's there's two billion people that live every day without electricity. Yeah, you see, this is the thing: is is mm -hmm. um, how yep. many people can be supported and with without without this so without the system, without the system. So it, the main thing is is uh, grains being grown at scale, the transport system, and and the oil right. basically, because we're just eating oil. So okay, there are a couple of things to say. First is that they will run out anyway. So uh, it's, it's, that's the thing that people... It's, it's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. So, so basically, all I'm arguing for is the accelerationist point of view. Now, there are two kind of acceleration. The, the accelerationists would say, you know, we can punch through by accelerating technology. So they're techno-utopians. Just they invest say, well, the shit we'll reach, out of this. Yeah, we'll reach the singularity of the nerds. We'll genetically engineer our way out of this. We'll colonize Mars. You know, basically, yeah, this is going to be so cool. We'll get through all these problems. And so those are um, uh, utopian accelerationists. There's a very sm small number. I hope I'm not the only one. But no, no, there are others. Derek Jensen and uh, Lyra Derek Keith, Jensen. all these guys. Yeah, they, no, there are a lot of guys that understand that we've got to... Jim Bendel, he's getting but there. But they're, they're <laughs> still, there's still a hierarchy there of saying, like, after degrowth, it's like, how many people does the plant support? And it's, 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 it would be good to go back to, like, the Civil War. So it's, I think it's about a billion. Sustainably, it's probably about a billion. So that, that means is is that you really culling 6.7 billion people by stopping civilization to save 1 billion. Now I put that, I just to test the water, I put the, a posting on Exxon Med discussing that and nobody wanted to go there. Really. Okay, let me stop you right there. The thing is Roger Hallam threw this out. Extinction Rebellion co-founder Roger Hallam, he threw this out. He said, if we don't do what we need to do, six billion people could die and 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 it, it caused a lot of pandemonium yeah but um, you see you see 
he's not even saying what I'm saying. He's saying we need to transition to to right. non or or six billion are not going to make it because we're yeah. going to run out of food because of civilization and yeah. because so, of industrialization. So just think how far away that is behind the curve because you know the people that are shooting him down are, are saying like, hey, you know, you're just trying to accelerate. We'll get to Narnia fine. Don't right. don't try rush it. Don't try be alarmist. You know, basically, we you know we can still finish our cake and and you know have our marmite and tea, and there'll still be loads of time to you know basically face the Spanish Armada. Well, right. it's like uh, so so they uh, they so far behind the curve that they don't realize that you know, this trajectory is not running till twenty one hundred and stuff like the you know, IPCC is saying. And then they saying, yeah, well, you know, we, we have time to transition. And then, uh, you know, Roger himself is not saying we can't transition. It's, it's a hard stop or, or uh, extinction. So, so, so you're saying something different than Roger. You're saying we, we stop civilization immediately. The system stops one way or the other. And then how are we going to feed everybody? Yeah, the thing is, though, that it's going to stop. Right? One way or the other, it's, it's, the machine's going to stop. stop. Soon. Yeah, I, do. I mean, you, you know that it's spinning out of control and it's going to go abruptly. It's not going to go smoothly. That's another thing the economists are, are and, um, and scientists too, in fact. They're not telling people enough that when it goes, it's a complex uh, web. And um, it's, it's a scale-free network. The economy is a scale-free network. Everything we do within that industry mm -hmm. is a scale-free network. It's kind of like, uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go down gently because no. uh, think of, you know, imagine you, you make some kind of widget and that widget has two gizmos and it has a flu bar. It's like, you can't make your, you know, the flu bar is not substitutable. So when, when you lose a ball bearing or something like that, and you can't source ball bearings, you can't make your product. So right, right, right. So it, 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 it stops abruptly. It's kind of like in Schweinfurt in, in Germany, they bombed the ball bearing factories. And, and that almost ended the war. Uh, <laughs> just... <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, basically, the, the uh, Speer, the mili mili Minister of uh, Production, Said if they mm -hmm. had carried on those raids, the raids were too expensive in terms of uh, bomber crews lost. But it is, as Speer said they were horrified because they said though, once they realized that ball bearings were used in everything and they were only made in Schweinfurt, then or 80% in Schweinfurt, they said, like, basically, if they'd lost all production there, the war would have been over in two months, according to Speer in 1943. Just, just getting rid of the ball bearings because they were used in everything. And our systems yeah. today have millions of these kinds of yeah, system-wide system. requirements. Yeah, in and, those, in that, that was relatively crude. You see, in, yeah, in yeah. those days, you have to imagine now is like you get something which you've never even freaking heard of, like uh, molybdenum or something like that. It's basically your, um, uh, you know, titanium. So it's something you think is not really a important strategic material. And then basically that's gone and suddenly nothing, you, you didn't know that it was an important um, component in, in high tech or something. And yeah, then yeah. there's just a cascade. People can't make aircraft and, you know, everything grinds, grinds to a halt. And then, so that, that could happen in manufacturing very easy. And then, of course, it's a JIT system. So nobody has any inventory. Uh, there's no right. redundancy. Yeah, yeah, just so in time just, inventory. It's brutal yeah. as all hell. And so that's... It's a Jenga, that's it's a Jenga tower, right? It's, it's a I mean, Jenga it's, tower. And so, so yeah, put, so, so that's another thing is if you want to stop the system everywhere, how can we stop this huge system, you know, billions in oil transferred every day. It's like, oh man, if you have any idea how fragile this system is, you, you, you know, could stop it easily. But they, that's beside the point. The, th the point is getting back to the thing about, uh, you know, no one wants to face the fact that, if you did a hard stop like that, uh, a lot of people would die. And so, right. and nobody so, wants that. But here's the thing if you're talking about climate justice and that, is the guilty people would die. People like us who live in cities and have done most of the consumption, 
Mm -hmm. We would be the ones. It's urbanites in, uh, basically that rely on all these massive networks. It, oh, and right, so there's right. climate justice in, in doing this. Climate justice is not getting fiat currency and chucking it at you know, indigenous people. Yeah. If we disappeared today, if, if all the capital cities became defunct, if there was a neutron bomb dropped on all of them, mm -hmm. there would be instant relief for most indigenous people around oh, the world. Oh, absolutely. We'd be out of so their that's faces. That's climate justice. Climate justice means basically making the people that rely on the system suffer most of the burden. And that means dying. Okay. It means basically what we've done is such a heinous crime that it deserves the death penalty. People who live in New York today and all these capital cities, Beijing, yeah. they deserve the death penalty a couple of times over for what they've done. Well, well think how many... If, okay, if well, well, okay, hold, hold on, hold on. Of, okay. I think how many generations that might might be. Uh, you I know, see what you're if, saying. If humans were a billion people on this planet. We might yeah. last for a thousand years. Right. So that's a oh. trillion people. Now, all effectively, those lives, with your, all those by lives living in, in New York and getting apples from New Zealand and flying around and thinking it's all Mary J, you've cost a trillion people their life experiences, a trillion people yet to be born. I'd say kill you in advance <laughs> okay but okay I, I see what you're saying i mean that's if you haven't cleared the room it's probably cleared now right and that's some pretty crazy rhetoric yeah. but yeah. let me just defend the people that live in in cities we completely inherited this nobody that lives on this planet today made any of this we inherited it we're blaming the boomers but they were born in the 1940s and the 1950s we've inherited these systems we inherited capitalism we inherited all this shit right yeah, all these systems we talk about in law and capitalism, this all came about before any of us were ever born. Yeah, we and have so to those people, I mean, children born in New York City are to blame for this. I and mean, that's yeah, because we have to take, um, I mean, come on, I mean, a part of morality is just taking account of who we are, and, and we are Westerners with a, a dominant uh mindset. The, our dominant culture goes right through even to our genes. I'll, I'll show you genes. That have uh, that we've been um, cultivating uh, that's that that make us unsu unviable, unviable uh, without uh, civilization. To, yeah, if if I get say like uh, a Kung person, a San Bushman from Africa, yeah, there's a viable human being left enough habitat. Um, if you if mm -hmm. you look at the they uh, they don't have cattle, so they like um, they lactose intolerant. They can store up food. If you go and try and live with them, uh, you would die soon. Because okay, okay. what, what if I took a baby? Fat. You can't eat in, in the in the regime that they do. They are genetically different. And, oh, just and so, genetics. Okay, so if yeah, I took but, a baby from a, a from a New York, you know, a child, you know, gave birth to a child in New York City and took a child there, baby, it would actually would, struggle genetically. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that it's got a white skin, it would have melanoma being out in the sun all the time. Right, right, right. Diet, but, but, okay. Uh, yeah, it's got allergies and stuff. And uh, just so, so we must, so what I'm saying is we must take account of who we are in terms of culture and all the way down to genetics. And so basically saying like, we're freaks, man, we're freaks. Okay, so you've got a, you've got a handful of people left and we've only got a few minutes left. <laughs> I don't What's think your... we've got anybody left of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's turned out the... to be quite a heart to heart. <laughs> this is like this is. I mean, this you're going down the list. I mean, this is you're, you're scaring the shit out of me. So, I mean, <laughs> what's the overall message? I mean, you're posting this stuff on XR Med on Reddit. Um, what do you want to say? So, so at the end of the day, let's just assume all that's true. So this is the, what I you see. What, you what I think I'm saying is the truth, and what okay. will happen is something completely different. So, what what I would so 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 if I'm right that and all the doomers are right that we really are you know going to go extinct, yeah. then then I think the way to look at it is uh, we need to clean up. We need to make sure as much of the planet survives. We mustn't be two species or homocentric and to, and think in terms of this is all about us it's saying like uh, you know I, if 
if it comes down to it, if we all have to die, well, I would like to go down to, you know, kind of scholar natura of consciousness and say, like, I would like bonobos next to survive if, if there are no humans left. I would like mm -hmm. chimps to survive, gorillas, um, you know, all the way down, elephants and all these things. It's like, you don't want dolphins to survive and whales? If, if we cannot survive, if we've cashed in our chips, yeah. I think we should do everything we can to, to make sure the next most conscious species survives. And all the way down till eventually you just, you get down to cyanobacteria and say, you know, we got to just incubate. You know, we might be the only life in the universe. There are trillions and trillions mm -hmm. of galaxies. But if you look at DNA and particularly kinase and things like that, Mm -hmm. it, it is weird enough that it almost demands a creationist response. If you look at molecular motors and stuff and mm -hmm. uh, how, it, you know, particularly kinase, how it, it unzips a, a DNA molecule and basically back translates. It loops around. Yeah. Back yeah. It's, it's it, you know, basically creationists say, yo, well, there's your evidence for design. Yeah. Say, well, there's another way to think of it saying it could have happened by chance, but just think, it might be a chance in a trillion trillion. Basically, I don't believe for a second that life is normal I, I, or, or run of the mill or common and in the rest of the, 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 uh, the, the galaxy or the, in, in other galaxies either. I think yeah. it really is a fluke. Maybe it is such a fluke, it's, it's a fluke in one universe. I, I'm quite just looking at kinase and the DNA molecule. I think there's a chance that that this is weird, weird, weird shit that made life. Right, and so if you believe that, and then you're looking at at the doom part yeah, of this, it, the takeaway is it's sacred. The takeaway it's very, very special, very, very sacred. I don't think they're aliens. The 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 you know SETI's coming back completely negative. They just did right, a survey right. of four thousand planets, and then everybody goes, see. They're all these plants. They must have life. And then mm -hmm. they came back and so said, only one's got water. And water is part and parcel of life. It's something to do with water. Life. So, so the stakes are really high. They're higher than people think. People are on way more cavalier. And people are then they're talking about human extinction. And then there's this um, joking about spiritual it. Cloud, a crowd that's very zen and philosophical about it. And says so cycles and it all comes around and says, no. This, this could be... This could be we, the audience of this great show in the universe might disappear. This might clean out the audience in the show. There might be left no one watching. So all right. this fantastic thing with planets exploding and black holes and quasars, this wonderful theater, no one watching. Right. And that's right. what that's what could be at stake. Basically, the universe would be a, a dull, dead zombie. Uh, wow! Wow! Consciousness. So that's so, an awesome place to end. Right there. Well, <laughs> is it worth? Would you sacrifice civilization to make sure that didn't happen? I would. I would sacrifice. I I would die, and I would expect um, six million people to die by association with civilization. In in order to in order to in order keep to, life. Yeah, yeah if, I, if they think like life and consciousness is sacred enough. They say like, come on, guys, do the kamikaze, man. Switch. The yeah. Switches. And, and it's not like you tell, you're putting these people in a gas chamber. You say, like, if you can make it without technology, have at it. There's, we're not forbidding you. We're just saying you can't carry on surviving the way you are. And you, right, can't, right. Pretend, you can't waste time pretending that you can reform it. So just flick the switch, man. Yeah. So let's go back to XR's first rule, right? First demand. Tell the truth. And you've done a really yeah, good well, job of that. I'm going to tell the truth here, but who wants yeah. to hear this truth? <laughs> right. So people who want to comment on this, they can leave comments here on YouTube, or they can go to Reddit and go to XR Med, and they can follow up with what you're what you're saying and make comments. Yeah, well, flame away. <laughs> yeah, let's let's get some flaming going. Uh, <laughs> all right. At least people are thinking, right? That would be cool. Yeah. All right, so let's, um, let's follow up in the future and do more of these.